Ephesians uh, class, uh, lesson number three. We've learned uh, so far about the uh, Ephesian letter, some background about the Ephesian letter. So here's some of the things that we've been talking about. First of all, Paul on his second missionary journey is returning from uh, Athens in Greece. He stops for a short time to teach at Ephesus. Uh, and he leaves uh, promising to return in the future. That was his strategy, establish a church, work with it for a while, move on to another place, work his way back to that congregation to kind of build it up. And so he continues that same uh, process here. When he returns to Ephesus, he rebaptizes some men, 12 men who had been taught by Apollos. And with these 12, the church in Ephesus is established. And we talk about that. We talked about that in our last lesson. Why were they rebaptized and all that business here? I'm not going to redo that this morning. Now in today's lesson, we're going to look at the city of Ephesus itself and Paul's early work there, and then begin a study of his letter to these brethren. So the story of the beginning of this church is found in Acts chapter 19. So we're studying Ephesians, but if we want some historical data on the establishment of this church, we have to go to Acts 19. We'll be reading a few passages there, so go to Acts 19 for now. Ephesus was a great city for its time. It was situated, is situated in modern day Turkey. It was a major port for Asia Minor. Uh, the street, uh, 70 feet wide, ran from the port right through the, uh, right through the city. And the population was approximately 300,000. So an ancient city like that, 300,000, that, that's even by today's standards, that's a good, that's a fair sized city. But in those days, that was a tremendous size for a city. The streets were lined with marble. They had public baths. They had a theater there that held anywhere between 25 and 50,000 people. Now the temple to the goddess Diana ranked as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was situated in Ephesus. A uh, hundred pillars held the roof. Diana was a, uh, a fertility goddess and drew pilgrims from all over the world. And one of the main reasons for Ephesus, uh, you know, that there was such trade there and so on and so forth, is they had a lot of traffic, a lot of pilgrims would come. We, we call them tourists today, but a lot of pilgrims would come to that, uh, to that city. Uh, around the temple was a community that housed artisans who made a very good living making coins and statues. Today we call them souvenirs. Making icons, uh, various icons of the um, goddess Diana, of the temple itself, the city. So much so that they had a union. A, they called it a guild, but they even had their own union. So in Ephesus, the culture, the religion, the politics, all of it was mixed together as one entity. And the closest idea of that for my experience was where I grew up in, in Catholic uh, Quebec. If you, were, if you were born in Quebec in the 40s, uh, then you were born into a place, uh, a province that had six million people, and 94 or five percent of those people were Roman Catholic. Uh, that meant that every mayor, every premier, every politician, every police chief, every, everybody, every teacher, every doctor, every lawyer, everyone uh, was Roman Catholic. Uh, the church ran the hospitals, they ran the schools, and uh, also ran the, you know, the politicians back in those days. Uh, so it was a complete, you know, when it, where I grew up, the, the Catholic church completely dominated the culture and and the religion uh, and the society of that time. Well, in the same way, the, the cult to Diana, and I'm not being insulting to Roman Catholics, I'm not comparing Roman Catholicism to Diana worship, but from a social perspective, uh, it was very much the same way. Everything revolved around this particular 
uh, worship and temple. So let's go to Acts chapter 19, read a couple of verses there. It says, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying, and there were in all about 12 men. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way, the way was the manner that they referred to Christianity at that time, Speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out but also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And I read that to show you some extraordinary things were taking place in Ephesus at the time. So note the, church of the, the, the growth of the church not only in Ephesus, but from Ephesus throughout the region as Christians you know, went about evangelizing. Uh, they were converted, they were sharing uh, the news of their own conversion, the news of Christ with their family members, uh, with their uh, friends and so on and so forth. So that's what he means. The word of the Lord went out. It doesn't mean that Paul went to every single village. It means as he was preaching there and those who were converted were hearing the word, were being converted, they themselves went out and began to share the gospel so that that whole region uh, was being evangelized. Well then comes the riot. So let's skip down. We don't have time to read all of these sections, but let's skip down to verse 21. Uh, again in Acts 19, it says, Now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So Paul feels that the church is well established so he sends two workers ahead of him to prepare for his next trip to uh, northern Greece, uh, and then hopefully Rome, and then return to Jerusalem. Again, I want you to notice the way that he does things. He, he comes in, he preaches, some people are converted, they're baptized, he works with them, helps them to spread the gospel. Once he sees uh, a group is firmly established, he sends two of his workers on to another place to prepare the, the, the place for his coming perhaps to preach the gospel or to make contacts and so on and so forth. So we see the same process taking place here. So um, uh, after sending his men ahead, he remains a little while longer to strengthen the church in Ephesus. And that's when the, the trouble begins uh, to take place. Uh, again, I don't have time to read this long uh, uh, passage here and I'm convinced that many of you already know uh, what's taken place. You know, the preaching of the gospel had begun to threaten the business surrounding Diana worship. So the local businessmen stirred up a riot focused on Paul and his companions. So long as it wasn't bothering anybody, you know, so long as the gospel is not bothering anybody, so long as you know, nothing is changing, well then you know, no one cares, do your thing. But now the preaching of the gospel is affecting the business because a lot of the people there who worship Diana and who supported that turn away from that type of thing and that in turn affects the bottom line of these businessmen. As we say, they, 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 they stir up a riot against Paul and his companions. Now they mention in this passage Artemis uh, and Ar you know, the, the goddess Artemis, so you're wondering, is it Artemis or is it Diana? Well, it's the same, two names for the same person. Artemis is the Greek form and Diana is the Latin form of her name. Actually, uh, the, the history of uh, the worship to Diana starts with a meteor. It was a meteor that fell from the sky 
and uh, the uh, Ephesians considered this a visit from the gods, if you wish. Uh, the meteor was actually encased in the entranceway, and that uh, became a holy place uh, for them at that time. Artemis, um, uh, the goddess Artemis, was the sister of Apollo, daughter of Jupiter and Latona in Greek mythology. Now, the riot and the threatened execution of a Roman citizen, that was Paul, was unlawful because Rome and Rome only controlled the courts. And so the riot began, the purpose of the riot was to get rid of Paul, hopefully to execute him or perhaps lynch him, if you wish, through the, through the mob. Eventually, one of the city leaders quelled the riot by pointing out that they were actually breaking the law by rioting and by threatening the lives of uh, certainly of Paul the Apostle because he was a Roman uh, citizen. Now th that was what was going on on the surface, but underneath this something else was working. The problem in Ephesus with Christianity and Diana worship is that Christianity refuses syncretism. Syncretism. Syncretism, when it's applied to religion, is the mixing together of religions to form one religion. And that's what, that's, that's what was taking, well, that's what the Christians at Ephesus were refusing to do. You know, pagan religions were often a mixture of several belief systems. You know, the Romans just took over the Greek mythologies, the Greek gods, and they just gave them Roman names and, and added some. So syncretism, I mean, it goes on today, for example. Hinduism the, is very much like this. It's a syncretic religion. That's why many Hindus accept Christ and they simply add Him to their pantheon of gods. Just one more. You know, the more the better. You know, the more the merrier. You know, if you've got one god, that's great. Two gods, better. Five gods, wow, how can you miss? So syncretism was a common feature of pagan religions at that time. Now, a primary feature of biblical Christianity, on the other hand, is that it refuses to be mixed with any other religion and uh, does not include, that does not include non-biblical principles of other religions. You know, if someone says, well, you know, the Hindus believe in their religion, for example, that you have to respect life. Well, oh, yeah, okay, that, that idea certainly is transferable to Christianity. It's not new to Christianity. Of course, we respect life because all, everyone is created in the image of God or all humans are created in the image of God. So, so those ideas are fine. But anything that's non-biblical, you can't, you can't mix them together. Um, the beauty of Christianity is that it refuses syncretism, but it adapts itself to culture you can adapt Christianity to any culture. The Church of Christ, for example, exists in China, much different culture than here. It exists in Ghana. It exists in, the, in Alaska. It exists in Rio de Janeiro. It exists in you know, the Middle East. Very different cultures all around. And yet Christianity has this flexibility, this malleability, that it, it can adapt itself to a culture without compromising its principles and its theology. It's the marvelous thing. One of the problems with Islam, for example, is that it, 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 it works well if you have a theocracy. In other words, if the politicians are Muslims and they, you know, they impose the the, the, the Sharia law. It works well, but it doesn't work that well when you try to you know, form it to a Western culture. It's one of the big problems that they're having. They, you know, Islam doesn't adapt very well to other, to other cultures. So it was this refusal to allow pagan Diana worship to influence it and its demand that idol worshipers abandon their practices that caused all the trouble. Had Paul and the Christians there said, you know what, just keep on going with your Diana worship, that's fine, just add Christianity to it. No, no, the idea was you had to give up what you had. You had to abandon what you had because it was false. And you had to embrace Christianity, all of Christianity. And that caused problems 
And does it still cause problems today? Well, absolutely. In certain Middle Eastern countries, uh, you can be executed for abandoning Islam for Christianity. So it's still, it's still a problem today. All right, let's talk about the letter itself to uh, Ephesus, the time and the author. After Paul leaves Ephesus, he goes back to Greece and ultimately he makes his way back home to Jerusalem uh, with a final stop, not at Ephesus, but near Ephesus, a place called Miletus, an island near the coast. Uh, and you read about that in Acts chapter 20. From here he gives instructions to the elders of the church there in Ephesus and surrounding area, and then they bid him a tearful farewell as he goes on to Jerusalem. Once he returns to Jerusalem, we learn from the final chapters of the book of Acts that Paul is in prison for a long period of time and ultimately he goes to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. Interesting thing, Lisa and I were talking about that this morning, you know, just talking about life and how God works in your life and how sometimes we want something to happen, whatever that is, and we give God the thing we want to happen and we give God the plan for it as well. And our prayer is usually, God, please let this thing happen and let it work out the way that I, you know, I've given you the script. And I'll know you're answering my prayer because the script I gave you is going to start happening. And so Paul, he had a thing like this. I want to go to Rome. Rome is the center of the universe you know, during his lifetime. I want to go to Rome and I want to speak to the heavy hitters in Rome. Boy, if the gospel could be preached to the emperor, if the gospel could be preached to the leaders in Rome, wow, imagine that. And here's the plan. I, I preach, I establish churches all the way to Rome, and then when I get to Rome, you know, jackpot. So what happens to Paul? He's arrested. He languishes in prison for years and years. He finally arrives in Rome, how? In chains, and he spends two years in prison as a prisoner in Rome. <coughs> yeah, he got the answer to his prayer, but was it his script? You know, we need to remember that. Sometimes you know, we need to be careful the script that we hand God. He might answer our prayer, but he'll do it in his own way and in his own in his own time. And so while Paul is under house arrest in Rome between 61 and 63 AD, he's visited by a succession of preachers and messengers from different congregations, giving him various reports on the condition and the progress of different congregations that he has established in the past. People like Epaphroditus and Timothy, Tychicus, these were all sent back with letters that Paul had written to encourage and teach various churches. Now we have copies of four of these letters written by Paul while in Rome. He may have written more letters. There is even evidence that he did write more letters, but only four remain. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and the letter to Philemon. Those were written while he was in prison awaiting his trial, if you wish, or his hearing. Now, Three of these four were written at the same time and they were sent by one messenger. The book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians, or the letters, if you wish, to Ephesians, to Colossians, and the letter to Philemon. We add another character here to the play. His name is Onesimus. Onesimus was a runaway slave and he was converted in prison by Paul in Rome. And eventually, when he was released, Paul sent him back to his master, and his master was called Philemon. So he sends Onesimus, that's the slave, with a letter to his master, uh, Philemon. Now Philemon was a member at Colossae, so the letter for the church was also brought by Onesimus as well. Paul says, give this letter to, uh, to uh, Philemon, he's your master, and give this letter to the church at Colossae. Now Ephesus was only 100 miles west of Colossae, and so on his way back, Onesimus also dropped off the letter to the Ephesians. The fourth letter that he wrote, the letter to the Philippians, was delivered by Epaphrodites. And I want you to note the correct spelling there's a, there's a misprint in your notes there. That's not how you spell Epaphrodites. 
All right, there's little doubt that Paul is the author of the letter to the, Philippi, uh, to the Ephesians in that he names himself in the very first verse and many historical writings show that Paul was universally credited with the writing of these four epistles by the early church and that was one of the criteria to establish inspiration. Did an apostle write the letter? And so there's early confirmation that Paul was the author of this letter. In other words, this is an authentic letter from Paul the Apostle and was recognized as such from the very beginning by the early church. All right, a couple of reasons for the letter. A lot of problems being faced by the first century church as it sought to be established and grow in a pagan society. One problem, there was immoral influence of the pagan society within the Roman Empire of that period. Now you have to understand, Jews, had a lot of moral training. The Ten Commandments, the law, the Jews were well trained in moral, you know, in moral uh, living. Uh, uh, about uh, uh, sexual purity, about honesty, and, 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 and all, these other, uh, all these other things. The Greeks, however, that came into the church, uh, they didn't have the same kind of moral upbringing, if you wish. For them, much of their worship involved sexual activity. Uh, there was tremendous uh, uh, dishonesty in business affairs. Uh, they did not have the moral upbringing, if you wish, uh, like the Jews. So when you put these two groups together in the same group, there were uh, problems. And so one of the problems was the level of morality uh, to maintain as Christians and teaching that was necessary to do that. Another problem was the open and active persecution of the church. The Jews were persecuted by, number one, their own people. If you were a Jew and abandoned Judaism to go into Christianity, you were cut off from your family. You were cut off from your culture. In addition to that, there was persecution by the state. So they were a minority group and they were cut off from their own minority. So they were like a minority within a minority. The Gentiles, on the other hand, didn't have that problem, but they did have the problem of the persecution that was taking place of religious groups other than those who uh, worshiped the emperor. And then the third reason for some of these letters, there were, there were the dangers of false teachers creeping into the church with uninspired teachings. Uh, one example was the mixing of Greek philosophical thought with Christianity, syncretism, or mixing Jewish law keeping and ceremonial law with the gospel of grace. I was talking to someone the other day about baptism and how you know, there's always this debate, should you be baptized, should you be baptized, is it necessary, is it not necessary, you know, and I pointed out to them that in the New Testament when the church was established, you will never find anywhere in the New Testament where there was a debate about baptism. Nobody, no, that was a non-issue. Nobody argued about should I or shouldn't I be baptized. Every person who believed was baptized. The argument at the beginning was not between should I be baptized or not. The argument at the beginning was are we saved according to a process of grace through faith? Or are we saved through a process of law and perfectionism? That was the debate that was taking place in the book of Romans, in the book of Colossians. Not whether you should be baptized or not, that was a, like, a non-issue. And so there was the mixing of different religions, the, 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 the debate over syncretism. Should we allow other ideas to come into the religion? And then, of course, there was the problem of getting converts from Judaism and converts from, you know, from Gentiles uh, to live together in harmonies as brothers and sisters in Christ. In other words, there was a culture clash to get these people together. And the culture clash was not based on skin color, it was based on background, but such a different background. So most of Paul's letters deal with these different issues. For example, 1 Corinthians, deals uh, very much so with the problem of immorality and proper conduct, personal conduct, conduct in the church, and of course division. 
The book of Colossians deals with the mixing of Greek and Jewish ideas with the gospel of Christ. The book of Galatians is an appeal to Jewish Christians to accept their Gentile brethren. And Ephesians was an appeal to Gentile Christians not to exclude Jewish Christians or anyone else for that matter from inclusion in the church. So where the Gentiles were in the majority, they didn't want to put up with the Jewish you know, sensibilities. You know, get with the program or get out. You know, that, that, that was their attitude. So it was an appeal to those who had no sentimental or cultural or historical ties to the Jewish religion, the Gentiles, they had no ties whatsoever. His appeal to them to be tolerant and accepting of those whose history and relationship to a Jewish Messiah was still important. For the Gentiles, Jesus was not the Messiah. You see what I'm saying? But to the Jews, He was the Messiah connected to all the prophecies. For the Gentiles, He was the Lord. Notice the apostles, when they were preaching to the Gentiles, performed miracles. Less so when they were preaching to the Jews. When they were preaching to the Jews, they were appealing to Scripture. This is what the prophets said. This is what Jesus did. This is what the prophet said. This is what Jesus did. This is what the prophet said. This is what Jesus, he had to convince them, they had to convince them from the scripture because that was the, you know, that was the acid test. The Gentiles, they had no, you know, they had no investment in the Old Testament. So to them, miracles were performed to say, you can believe what I'm saying because of what I'm doing. So it was to merge these two groups together as one. Now Paul did not want to see two churches, one Jewish and one Gentile. He wanted both of these to be accommodated in one single body, one body only. So his defense of the Gentiles was seen in his teaching and associating with them while calling out to his Jewish brethren to accept them as full partners in Christ. Let's face it, he was a Pharisee. He was part of the strictest sect of the Jewish religion who would never have even come close to a Gentile. And now as a Christian, as a preacher, he eats with them, he associates with them, he works with them. And this was an encouragement to Gentiles who understood the, you know, the way he had to travel. And it was also a sign to the Jews, wow, if this former Pharisee who was converted to Christianity, if he can embrace these Gentiles you know, through Christianity, certainly we can do it too. That was his appeal to the Jews. Now his appeal from Gentiles to the Jews was seen in his effort to collect money from Gentile churches in order to help the Jews in Jerusalem suffering from a crippling famine. We read about that in 1 Corinthians. And the idea there was, if Christian Jews had problems accepting Gentile Christians, this gift was meant to break down their resistance and their suspicion. We're starving to death, we're having trouble financially, and who helps us? Who's sending us money? Gentile Christians. That went a long way to smooth out you know, the wrinkles in their relationship. And it still does today, right? A kind act. You do a kind act for someone that you, have, you, know, you don't have a lot in common with, doesn't that smooth out the, the way to, to build a relationship? So in his letter to the Ephesians who were experiencing the divisiveness between Jew and Gentile, Paul describes a church that is big enough and loving enough to include Jewish and Gentile Christians as well as, as people of different genders, viewpoints, and experiences. And isn't that a, 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 a lesson that we continually learn even today? Perhaps less culturally, because this country is so mixed and diverse culturally, but the idea of having a viewpoint, of having an opinion, don't we always have to work to make room to allow people to have their opinion and to have their viewpoint without you know, dividing, creating new groups just because we don't agree on some point? Now in addition to this, Paul demonstrates in this epistle how unity and order in the church, in the family, in society, and in the spiritual world can be achieved through Jesus Christ, who is the head of the body of believers. 
So it's interesting to note that Ephesians is the only letter where Paul uses the word church in the universal and not in the local congregational sense. The only place where he talks about the church, meaning the entire body of Christ wherever it meets. Every other time when he, talks, when he uses the church, ecclesia, when he uses that word, he's talking to the local congregation. So Ephesians has a, a kind of a wide view. You know? it has, it's, an over, it's a macro view, if you wish, of the church. One commentator has called Ephesians the epistle of the church. So we can say the book of Acts describes the physical history of the church, and the book of Ephesians describes its character. Big difference. Okay, so the theme, of course, is the centrality of the church. Let's take a look at the outline. This is how we're going to study it. First of all, the first section, the blessings of the church. Ephesians 1, 1 to verse 23. Uh, probably the most beautiful section, if you wish, the most exalted section uh, of Paul's uh, epistles. Um, you know, people say, well, we're going to look at the plan of salvation, and they go to the book of Acts, but really the plan of salvation is right here in Ephesians. If I want to see the plan of salvation, I'm going to look at Ephesians chapter one as you know, one place where they describe it. The second section will be the universality of the church, chapter two, verse one, to chapter three, verse 21. This is where Paul is talking about you know, the body as it meets everywhere. The third section, the obligations of the church. So the blessings of the church, the universality of the church, the or obligations of the church, and the obligations of the church are threefold. One, unity. Because if you don't have unity, you can't have anything else. Righteousness, how we are to live as Christians. 417 to 69, and then faithfulness, chapter 6, verse 10 to uh, verse 24. Unity, righteousness, faithfulness, those are the obligations of the members of the church. So Ephesians, more than any other epistle, demonstrates how important and how central the church is to God's plan and purpose for mankind. Uh, if someone were to say to you, you know, I don't need the church because God and I are friends, and uh, you know, I'm with God when I'm you know, out, in the, out in the forest, when I'm out walking in the forest, I, I'm with God. Why do I need to come to a, like a, a man-made church building? You know, I'm, I'm with God when I'm, out, when I'm in my boat out on Lake Hefner. I'm with God. And at night when I go to bed and I pray, I'm with God. I don't need the church. When somebody says that to me, the first thing that comes to my mind is, first of all, this person does not know the Bible. This person has not read very carefully the scriptures. And the second thing that comes to mind is, this person certainly has not read Ephesians. Because in Ephesians, Paul, through the inspiration of God, talks about the universality and the importance of the body in Christ, a body of Christ, and he exalts the church to such a high level, such a necessary level. There is no Christianity without the church. That's why Jesus came to earth, to establish the church. So we're going to be talking a lot about the church, less about its history, you know, that would be the book of Acts, more about its character, and also how God sees the church. A terrific, a terrific study here in the book of Ephesians. All right, well that's our class for this morning. Any questions, are we good? That's what I like. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.